you doing? Hello. Hi. I am Jamie Poissant. I teach in the MFA program here at the University of Central Florida, and uh, I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight. So here we go. Matt Bell and I are not friends. <laughs> we are working on it. Let me explain. Five AWPs ago, I think I might have met him. One AWP ago, I think I was standing next to him at a bar watching Steve Amon read something funny and obscene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I see, I, I'm pretty yeah. sure. <laughs> but what has happened over the years is that people keep thinking, I know Matt Bell. People were occasionally mistaking me for Matt Bell. People were somehow under the impression that Matt Bell and I went way back, though Matt and I had only ever maybe met once in passing at an AWP book fair, which, if you've been at an AWP book fair, you know is almost like not meeting somebody at all. <laughs> and so last year, steely with determination to make Matt Bell my friend, I went to Facebook, where I discovered, and I swear I'm actually not making this up, we had 253 mutual friends. <laughs> By what cosmic calculus could we know so many of the same people and not be friends? And so I Facebook friended him and he accepted. <laughs> it was a beautiful day. And when he accepted the GWA invitation to come to UCF to read, I knew that our friendship was blossoming. <laughs> that it would soon be official and not just Facebook official but a real and abiding friendship, perhaps even a bromance in the making. <laughs> we'll see that the night is long and there are many beers ahead of us. But before the after party, I'm pleased to introduce Matt Bell, the author of the novella, Cataclysm Baby, the story collection, How They Were Found, as well as the novel, In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, from which he will be reading tonight. His stories have appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies, including Conjunctions, Fairy Tale Review, Ninth Letter, and the Best American Mystery Story Series. An editor with Zank Books and the founding editor of The Collagist, Matt Now Teaches, and the MFA program at Northern Michigan University in Marquette. Let's all welcome Matt. I'm not really taken with this idea of having a bromance with you. <laughs> And that I can be the Seth Rogen to your Catherine Heigl, and it'll be, it'll be quite nice. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for coming. It's really exciting to be here. Um, this is amazing, amazing amount of people. This is really great. Um, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to read from In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, which I'll tell you more about in just a second. Um, I'm also going to ask to maybe talk a little bit about a, a craft issue or something that might relate to writers. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about... Uh, a short craft talk about fairy tales and about some of the tools that I've extracted from fairy tales which are really important to me um, and which I'm, I'm sure you'll see in the reading and then afterwards I'm happy to answer questions about, about anything you hear tonight or about other concerns you have as writers um, I, as Jamie talked about I've worked in publishing for the last four or five years in addition to teaching and if there's anything that I can talk to you about I'm happy to okay awesome um, so I'm going to read from In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods. I'm going to read three short chapters, sort of spread through the first hundred pages, just to give you the broadest possible overview of the book. It's a, a myth, um, a fairy tale about marriage and about parenthood. It's narrated by the uh, husband in a newly married couple. The husband is a fisherman, later a trapper. Um, the wife is a, a beautiful singer. Her voice, when they come to this place, the dirt between the lake and the woods, is able to sing objects into being. Initially in the book, she sings small household objects to furnish their house. Later, she sings a second moon into the sky. Um, the husband is obsessed with this family he wants to have, um, but things go wrong in that regard um, because it's a story and things have to go wrong. And um, the husband ends up with a ghost child that lives inside him uh, that he calls the fingerling. That, that speaks to him, sort of turns him against the mother. The wife brings home a child from the woods called the foundling. There's a giant bear that lives in the woods. There's a giant squid that lives in the lake. And from there, it starts to get weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the basic premise. Um, your average, everyday, domestic realism. Um, I'm going to read three chapters. The first one starts, um, it's, it's the, the longest bit of backstory in the book. Um, it talks about their wedding day and also the first meeting of the husband with this bear 
who for much of the book is his primary antagonist. Thank you so much. On the day of our wedding, on some now distant beach, my wife had sworn herself to me with ease and in faith, and I did likewise for her. Together we made the longest promises, vowed them tight, and it was so easy to do this then, to speak the provided words. We did not know what other harder choices would necessarily follow as we made our first life together in a new city. And then again, after we left that country and journeyed to the dirt, this plot stationed so far from the other side of the lake, from the mountains beyond the lake, on whose distant slopes we had once dwelled in the land of our parents, where perhaps there still perches that platform where we stood to speak our vows. How terrible we must have seemed that day, when together we were made to believe our marriage would then and always be celebrated by ceremony and by feasting, by the right applause of a hundred kith and kin, and then later how we were terrible again upon this far lonelier shore, where when we came, we came alone. When we first arrived upon the dirt between the lake and the woods, then there was still sun and moon, only one moon, and stars too, all the intricacies of their intersections circumscribing the sky, their paths a tale to last every night, a waking dream to fill the hours of every day, and despite that bounty, my wife was often flushed with tears, because what world we had found was not enough for her, not enough for me, not without the children we desired, that I desired and that she desired for me, and despite her doubts, she said that she would try if that was what I assured her I wished. In those days, there was no house, and until there was, we required some place to sleep, to store the many objects we had been gifted at our wedding. And so we went into the woods to seek a cave, and in a cave we laid out our blankets and stacked our luggage, and there my wife waited amid that piled potential while each day I went out onto the dirt while I raised a house with just my shovel and axe, my hammer and saw, my hands hardened by the same. In that cave, I did not leave her alone, though I had meant to do so. And all this happened long ago, when I still thought meaning to do something was the same as doing it. And I too was lonely as I built the house, and then the first rough shapes inside. I built the table and chairs, fashioned the stove and the sink, crafted the bed where I would lay my wife the first night I brought her across the threshold, where, as I watched, the ink of her hair wrote one future after another across the pillows and sheets, and in that splay of black on white, I smiled to see the, all the many possibilities of our family formed out of her body, drawn into my arms. But first another memory, the first time I spied the bear watching me from within its woods. And when I saw it, I stilled my work upon the dirt, moved slowly to set down the tools with which I had not quite completed the house. At the tree line that marked the edge of the woods, the giant bear's back hackled, increased its size again, and the wedge of its head swayed huge and square from its massive shoulders, its mouth spilling yellow teeth and lolling tongue, exhalation steaming the morning chill. In the face of its stare, I stared back, and the bear slavered in response, shook its th thick fur as welcome or warning, and when it saw it had my attention, it stood on its huge hind legs, its stamping body a dark tower opening, opening to push a roar up toward the heavens, toward the sun that in those days still ran full circle. I froze, afraid the bear would charge, and in my fear I for a breath forgot my wife. And in the next breath I remembered, flushed with the shame of that forgetting, the bear growled and raked the ground and paced the tree line. For my remove, I noted the strangeness of its rankled movement, and also how it was not exactly whole. Where brown fur should have covered the expanse of its back, that fur was in places ripped, and the skin below was torn, so that an armor of bone poked through the wound, yellowed and slickly wet. Still the bear seemed hardly to know its hurt, its movements easy, unslowed, perhaps untinged with pain. It roared, roared again, then abruptly it returned to the pathless woods, 
its bounding passage wide, but somehow also impossible to track, the bear tearing no new way, breaking no brambles despite the bulk of its body. And then I too was running into and through the woods by my own path, across the avenues of pine straw, back to where I had left her, the cave where all our possessions were stored. I arrived to find our crates and cargo shattered upon the cave's floor, our clothes shredded, our clock broken, our wedding albums ripped from their bindings. With the passing of those photos some mem went some memories of the old world across the lake, a place perhaps already doomed to fade soon after arrival in this new one, but now lost before I had erected the structures necessary to withstand that loss, and still some more terrible fear welled large within me, because despite my many cries, my wife did not make herself known, and so for some time I did not know if she was alive or dead. She's not dead. <laughs> Don't worry. Short book. Um, so, they, so they try to have children, and, and, and things go badly, as I said. Um, the, the, so in this next chapter, the, the fingerling is already living inside the husband, um, and the wife in, in this chapter is sending the husband, she's pregnant for the last time in the book, and she's sending the husband into the woods to start to trap meat um, that she, they before had only ate fish, and now they're starting to eat meat, and it signals some kind of change in their family. Um, okay. We had never before eaten meat, only fish, but the woods in those years brimmed with life, and at my wife's request I began to trap that bounty, so I might bring home new sustenance for her table, so that she might make the furs into blankets meant to keep her warm while she grew this best last chance of a child. But the smell of seared rabbit or boiled squirrel turned my stomach, and I could not be made to try it, preferring instead the catch from the gray waters of the lake. My wife had no such hesitation, and so took apart whatever I found with fork and knife, with savage fingers tearing seared muscles into smaller bites fit for her greased lips. I faced into her new gluttony, its sight offending from across the table, and at the fingerling's suggestion, I asked her why she needed these new foods, this meat that came to displace fish and fruit and vegetable, until all her diet was red and bloodied as never it had been before. In my father's house, she said, we ate only fish, but I am no longer in my father's house, and the old ways no longer bind me. She slid her pooled plate toward me, said that in this small world there were pleasures and powers I had not yet imagined, and that through them we might find some strength to share. She said, together we will remake this dirt the sky above it and the ground below, and all the animals and birds and fish that crawl and fly and swim upon and around it. And by our own new laws, we will be better married, made anew, a family, she said. What you have always wanted at last arrived. For one way or another, I have found the will to give it. I did not know then of what she spoke, was afraid of this new manner in her speech. It sounds so like my own worst thoughts, like those of the fingerling. And so I shook my head, asked her not to speak this way again, and after she withdrew her plate, I returned to the woods, where afterward I spent more and more of my time. In my absence, my wife filled our rooms with more new-sung objects, baby things for our baby, made this time from no template of mine, but rather out of her own imagining. Meanwhile, I turned my anger to task as I worked to empty the woods of all the animals favored by the bear, who I came to believe was lord over that shaded domain. When I say belief, I do not mean I know what I believed, knew what I believed, not in the way I had believed before coming to the dirt, in steepled buildings made to organize such feelings. Things were odder here than they were elsewhere, and most stories were not written as clearly. On the other side of the lake, across the mountains, the truth had been inscribed in the stars and could not be changed. Here, upon the dirt, my wife wiped clean that sky-flunked slate, and so I was not sure what to believe or where to look to rediscover what once I had simply known. Throughout this pregnancy's middle months, the fingerling and I continued to trap the woods, to bring home what meat and furs we earned. 
Our nights stretch troubled, some feeling in the gut, appearing in my dreams as in the fingerlings, its shadow disrupting our sometimes blended nightscapes with unsure, unsure worries. From within those sleepless nights, I would emerge blearily from the house, returning to the woods to check my traps for ferret or fox, for rabbits or wild hounds stuck in the steel jaws of my mechanisms, and because I did not know what else to do with those whose meat she refused, I took up the taxidermist craft, the tanners, to skin, to scrape, to preserve the furs, to make my wife shut them with needle and thread, for when our first clothes had turned to rags, to reclaim them as memory, their bodies arranged with glue and wire, their skin stretched over wood forms meant to decorate the walls of our house, to displace the long, empty picture frames. Above the traps, where shafts of moonlight descended through the branches, often a space existed wherein some segment of the shifted sky could be seen, where the last stars remaining did not retain their original seats, but rather slid along new curves, their past distorting as the second moon's weight tugged the sky. Each night, the fingerling cataloged this movement, and together my eager watcher and I searched for other signs, like how the one white glow of my wife's moon was perhaps even then tinged some shade of pink, and the sky was not all we watched, nor all we wondered about. More and more, we pondered what my wife learned in the cave, that house of the bear, when we lived there without knowing to whom the cave belonged. How long did she know about the bear before it awoke from its long sleep? How long did my wife know, and what did she find between the time of her first knowing and that awakening, the bear rising to chase her from its home? Whatever she found, was this the source of her stronger songs, of the voice that made her words more powerful than mine, even though it was I who had claimed this dirt to rule? Or was it something else, something she and I had done together? That was the question I worried at, that I gnawed at like a bone, a cast-off rib too stubborn to share its marrow. And when at last that bone broke, what truth escaped its fracture was by it remade. For even our bones had memories, our memories bones. Um, I'm going to read one last chapter about this, and then we'll, we'll stop and reset and go into sort of the craft talk part. Um, this is about 60 pages later, about 100 pages in the book. Um, there's a, 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 the family sort of becomes further estranged from each other with the, the husband and the fingerlings are on one side, and the mother and the foundling, who by this point is a, is a toddler, he's five or six. Um, and at some point, an act of violence sort of separates them. And the wife uh, takes the foundling and, and flees the husband, but she flees into this, uh, this labyrinth that she's sung into being under the house. Um, and the husband goes after her, and what he finds is a, is a memory palace, and in each room of this labyrinth, she's sung into being one aspect of their life together, or of their marriage, or of the world they live in. Um, and so he sort of passes through their marriage in his pursuit of her. Um, and this is the first floors of that place, which he calls the deep house. Memory, as first expiration of the deep house, as this progression of rooms, to follow the many staircases down to the many landings, the many hallways branching out from behind progressively heavier doors, to open the first rooms and find the deep house made now a palace of memory, a series of rooms in which what I had forgotten had been curated, collected together with what I had tried to forget, and also with other moments that occurred only in dreams, or else not at all, not for me. To find in each room some unadorned spectacle, my wife, or me, or us together, with or without those children we had failed to have, plus the one she had stolen that she had passed off as our own, or not passed off, but made true. It was in those passages that I saw how even if I had not accepted the foundling into my family, still my wife had accepted him into hers, put him at its center, a space I believed I had once occupied, and so our house was divided, and then divided again, because what house might stand against a child loved by only one parent when the jealous other held that same child in suspicion and contempt? And how for me, the fingerling remembered everything. How the fingerling saw even what I would have left undiscovered, what I did not want to share with him or any other child. 
how even then he rode most often in my belly, in my thigh, in my throat, so that he might always be close to the skin, soaking in the new air as I moved my body through. And so he was there too in each of those many rooms, where otherwise there would have been only me, always me, me lonely and me alone among the tiny domains of my wife, sung into being as she passed, echoed throughout the deepening dirt. In the first room, I found piled the cargo we lost to the bear. Here again were the broken vases and cracked crystal, the shattered punch bowls, the punched out platters. Here were the shredded rags of my wife's dress, and beside them my boutonniere, meant to be preserved inside a translucent bubble, now freed from where it had been glassed. Here was the intricate mechanism of a handmade clock, gifted and then broken, stopped as all their clocks were eventually stopped. All these objects, seemingly each its own, but merely parts of a whole, what in the cave we had lost. And in this room, her wedding ring discarded. She had improved everything I had given her, but not this. And so its simple band remained only what it had ever been. I held the ring in my hand, and then I took off my own ring, and I laid both upon the stones, touching. Rings had been insufficient to fasten us together, and it would take more than rings to rebind what had been broken. And in this room, the sound of my wife's knuckle first sliding beneath the beaten silver of that ring, a sound never before heard or else forgotten amid all the other business of our wedding day. And in this room, the footprints she made on the beach where we are wed, where we had stood atop that platform, separated by the priest and then joined by the same. And all this upon that other sunnier shore, where it was not always summer, but where often it was summer enough. And in this room, where my footprints that evening were, not always by her side, only sometimes so. And how I wished it had been different, that I had not walked away at the beginning of our marriage when I thought it would always be so easy to return. And in this room, the words I used nearly every summer after to beg from her one more child, even after she was determined only to stop the trying, and also before she found she wanted her motherhood again, wanted it this time for herself, wanted it more than even I had ever wanted or realized. And in this room, the scent of my wife's perfume as she passed, a smell once lovely, now stale as glue, and how I missed its original, how I had missed it. And in this room, every graying hair she pulled from her head or her body in the failed years between the fingerling and the foundling. Every piece of skin she rubbed raw in the bath, when between miscarriages she could not scrub away the hormone stink of motherhood falsely begun, all that hair and skin stuck wet to the floor, and in this room a, wet su a white suit that no longer fit, a shirt that wouldn't button, a tie that drew its knot too quick around the neck, the relics of a body betrayed against itself and against my wife, who had not agreed to love what fat and hair had acquired, nor the blank spaces replacing what it had lost, those first few teeth, those other small kindnesses. And in this room, my wife's garden, if she had not abandoned its offerings to eat the meat of the woods, what she might have grown with the labors of her hands instead of the song of her voice, what this dirt would have yielded to us if only she had again given the sun leave to shine. And in this room, a silver bowl full of her tomatoes, one taste of which revealed the tang of their song stuff, their lack of right reality, despite skin, despite juice and seeds. And in this room, all the faces of the fish I had taken from the lake, piled into a single mash of eyes and gills, teeth and scales. How surprised I was to see them. How easy it was to forget how many lives I took just to keep myself alive, to feed my wife and the foundling, all these bodies knifed open so we may continue another day. And in this room, the buzzing of bees, and then elsewhere, another room full of bees. Two separate rooms, one with the bees themselves, silent, and the other filled only with their sound. How many more rooms I knew there must be if that continued. How much more house it took to keep things separate, to break them down. And in this room, the smell of decomposing onion and beet 
potato and rutabaga, all that vegetal rot. And in this room, the last sunflowers of my wife's garden, the first that stretched their petals toward her red moon, instead of the sun that barely again rose over the dirt, and the light of the moon was mere reflection, and the light of two moons doubly so. Why then their different hues against the vast black of the sky, and in this room a fistful of black seeds? In the next room, the shell of the bear, its proud bone stuck through its skin, its bristled fur fallen like pine needles, its claws pulled from their moorings, its teeth loose in its jaws, its breath rotten as fallen bark, worm struck as the earth beneath its woods, stinking of meat eaten long past its date. And in this room, my wife's favorite dress, worn the first time she danced with me. How when I held the fabric to my face, I smelled nothing because the smell of her sweat was in another room. And in this room, a well-scrubbed floor and on it a well-scoured pot scratched by the removal of meals we shared, of meals we ate apart. And in this room, a bowl made of mirrors so that as I drank of it, it drank of me. And in this room, the song of the stars never heard after a silence above the dirt and before that never this clearly. How I'd forgotten even what I had forgotten. This series of notes that made a song, that made a story. Also hard to retell without their sharp light present. Hard to hear or hum even when the stars yet hung from the sky. And impossible now their shapes had been extinguished. And again my wife had remembered as I had not. And in this room lightning and in this room thunder, and in this room, how long it had been since it rained. Thank you. <laughs> Whew, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jamie asked me also to uh, talk briefly about a, an issue of craft. Um, and I was asked to write a, a, a newspaper column about craft, and so, so this is the one I wrote. And what I wrote about was um, fairy tales, and, and particularly these aspects of fairy tales that I, I use a lot in work, that even when it doesn't seem as fairy taleish as this does. And one of those is, is flatness, flatness of character, um, which I think is sort of the opposite of what we're normally taught, which is roundness of character. Um, and, uh, and so I'll just read this. Uh, it's fairly short. It was a newspaper column, so it's not super long. And, uh, and then I'm happy to take questions and comments, and we'll go from there. All right? Thank you so much for your, your very kind attention. An accepted truism of many writing workshops is that to make a story better is almost always to increase the psychological depth of the story's characters, to make them rounder, more fleshed out, or fully developed, more believable. I want to know more, the workshop often cries, but this advice doesn't work for every kind of story. In fairy tales and myths, for instance, flat central characters are not just standard, but necessary. Think of Little Red Riding Hood, the way that the titular piece of clothing stands in place of a name, the way its shape creates little more than a suggestion of a body, a scrawl underneath which a reader must conjure his or her own girl. Think of the wolf, red meats, all big eyes and big teeth, and not much else. In her essay, Fairy Tale as Form, Form as Fairy Tale, Kay Bernheimer explains that in fairy tales, characters are by necessity always characterized by their flatness. She describes these characters as silhouettes, saying that they are not given many emotions, perhaps one such as happy or sad, and that they are not in psychological conflict. Other signs that a character may be meant to be read as flat include the absence of a proper name or lack of physical description, little or no backstory. In his introduction to his own retellings of the tales collected by the Grimm brothers, Philip Pullman provides another useful metaphor, saying that fairy tale characters are like the flat cardboard cutout figures of a toy theater, each with only one side visible to the audience, the only side we need. The other side is blank. It is this blank side that all flat characters share that I'm interested in, that I think makes flatness powerful. As fiction writers, how can we capitalize on flatness to create compelling protagonists and antagonists? When is it better to know less about a character than more? Contrary to what most of us have been taught, Bernheimer says this flatness functions beautifully because it allows depth and response in the reader. 
This occurs in part because flatness allows the writer to control the amount of psychological complexity characters are given, in addition to controlling the access readers have to that psychology. In the most successful examples, this creates a striking effect. As our creative writing teacher suggested, readers do, in do indeed seem to crave a kind of roundness in a story's primary characters. And if flatness is rendered right, then what the story doesn't offer, the reader will provide, filling in the blank side of the silhouette with the best material they have to offer themselves. For instance, in Cormac McCarthy's post-apocalyptic novel, The Road, how many people have read The Road? Yeah, good book. Um, the characters initially seem flat, with McCarthy, McCarthy referring to them only as the father and the son, the man and the boy. McCarthy also offers only spare physical descriptions, easily allowing his protagonist the ability to stand in for other fathers, other boys. Of course, it doesn't take long to realize that McCarthy's characters are psychologically complex in a way that characters in fairy tales and myths rarely are. But there are still some other aspects of flatness at work. In addition to leaving his characters unnamed and mostly undescribed, McCarthy gives only tiny glimpses of the father's past, often delivered without context, and little that is revealed is ever referred to again. This lack of clear backstory introduces a blank into the story, a, narrative, a vacuum in the narrative, one which the reader must fill with his or, own, his or her own experience. Excuse me. Because readers don't know exactly what the father has been through or how he became the man he is, they're forced to extrapolate based on their own experience, not just as a response to the text, but in order to make the text go. Consciously or not, the reader asks, if I were this father, what would it take me to make me the man he is? In the context of the road, that's perhaps a terrifying question to ask, but it leads inevitably to greater personal investment in the more important question that sets up much of the book's, that sets up much of the book's morality. If I were this boy's father, would I be willing to go as far to protect him? As the reader fills in the blanks left by the flatness, these questions implicate the reader and the father's actions, which allows the moral complexity of the book to cut deeper, especially in those places where a chasm stands between the father's actions and the actions the reader might have chosen <coughs> instead. Another interesting effect occurs whenever a writer combines fairy tale characterization with the grounded, concrete worlds we have come to expect from most contemporary fiction. Consider the Birdman in Karen Russell's Swamplandia. People read that? Yeah, good. Um, the Birdman in Karen Russell's Swamplandia, whose very name suggests a kind of flatly magical character. And in fact, Ava Bigtree, the narrator, first describes him like a character out of just such a story, calling him an avian pied piper. But a few sentences later, Ava also reveals that the Birdman is a sometimes employee of the Florida Wildlife Commission, an organization surely far too mundane and bureaucratic for myth and magic. One of the main tensions of Swamplandia is between the family's more mythic world in the 10,000 Islands and the real world of the mainland. The Birdman seems at first to be drawn from the fantastical side of this divide, at least before his actions reveal him to be a danger just as likely cut from a police blotter as from a book of tales. What discomfits us first about the Birdman is not only the danger he eventually presents, but rather the way in which his flatness renders him unknowable because it's always what we cannot fully know that scares us most. One other common quality of flat characters is they often remain essentially unchanged by the events of the story. Little Red Riding Hood doesn't necessarily become someone new, doesn't experience an epiphany or a change of heart. She doesn't renounce the forest or reevaluate a relationship with her grandmother, doesn't re home suspicious of the mother who sent her in the wolf-filled woods in the first place. Because we crave causality and want to see the consequences of actions, whenever those consequences do not play out on the page, they seek to play out inside us instead. It's our emotions that have filled those characters, and it's ourselves that might be changed what happens because of their actions. By creating purposeful spaces and blanks and omissions, flatness allows the logic and emotion and morality of the story to occur inside the reader instead of on the page paving the way for flatnesses, promised great depth of response. For this to happen, there can be in the end no last wink or flinch, no indication of the proper response imposing judgment where the reader might be allowed to judge instead. Wherever flatness works, 
It is almost always accompanied by this kind of withholding, another tactic we've been cautioned against in our workshops. But the withholding of flatness is a withholding that gives, and its gift is an experience in which the reader is not just audience, but participant, invested and complicit in the actions of the story, and hopefully more fully affected and changed by its outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful, wonderfully kind and listening audience. Um, I'm happy at this point to answer questions, comments, concerns, angers. <laughs> I might as well start. So what was the, uh, the mindset that you're in in terms of choosing the bear and the squid as the primary animals in the novel? Um, accident? Um, <laughs> I... Uh, so I'm, I'm not a planner. I couldn't, write, I couldn't write an outline for something and have it turn out maybe for the life of me. Um, I, I very much prefer to sort of start from, a, from really from voice if possible, like a voice that interests me. Um, and so I started on the first day I was working this book writing in the, the voice of this character. I mean a very a proto voice of this, right? I didn't have this voice, but like a voice that would become it. Um, and I was just writing sentences, and I was, trying, I was trying to be recursive. I was going back to the sentence I liked and trying to pull something forward, trying to keep that going. Um, and I think the first day I worked on it, I wrote about 1,000 words. And somehow in that first 1,000 words, I wrote, uh, the first thing I wrote was the husband watching the wife singing and seeing these shapes inside her that would one day come into being. Um, I wrote about um, the bear, and I didn't know what I was writing about. And I swear to God, I had this thought, if there's a bear, there must be a squid, which doesn't... <laughs> I don't know what that means <laughs> about me, um, but I think that bears and squid are natural balances. If there's good, there's evil. If there's a bear, there's a squid. If there's a man, there's a woman. Um, but I did, and I so I wrote this thing, and I wrote this sentence, which I didn't know what meant, which was... Um, for me, the fingerling, and for you, the foundling, and now never will our family like come together. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know who those people were. Um, fingerling, foundling, good words though, right? And I, um, and I was excited. And so I sort of, in the first day, just wrote like this series of mysteries that I then spent like a year unpacking, right? And chasing down. I didn't know what the bear was up to for a really long time, but I knew that I could write scenes if I just kept sending the husband into the woods, right? Like, um, I mean, if you're just trying to create conflict, a giant sentient decomposing bear in the woods, just go see that again. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the squid took longer because it was more mysterious in a certain way. And there, you know, you're at the bottom of a lake less often than you're in the woods. Um, <laughs> does this still happen in Florida? Same rules here. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Like, it's weird. It, it, they just weren't consciously chosen. They, were, they somehow emerged. Um, I have this rule that I sort of invented a while ago uh, from reading about improv comedy. Um, which I don't really know about, a lot about, so I'm pro pretty much just making this up. Um, <laughs> but that there's this rule of improv comedy where, in which the two people who are improving a scene have to, like, you have to agree with each other and add. Like, to say, like, yes and, right? Other people are nodding, people know this. Um, I think in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, he talks about, like, the subconscious, how this works, and he talks about, um, uh, I think the example he uses is, uh, so you're starting an improv comedy skit, and the first person says, I have a wooden leg and it's covered in termites. And the other person says, no. <laughs> and then the scene is done, right? Um, but if the other person says, uh, yes, and they're getting over my chair and then falls out of his chair, now we're doing something, right? We're rolling. Um, and so I think about that for novel writing a lot or story writing, that rather than thinking, this is what my thing is about and every idea that comes up has to be excluded, I sort of do the opposite. Like anything that occurs, like <laughs> the squid is the opposite of a bear. Um, just like jam it in. Make it work. The, the making it work will be generative. Like new things will happen because you're making work these things that don't, on the face of them, seem to work. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's that allowing things that don't seem like they belong into the work and then forcing them to work. And of course, some things don't work and you cut them out later. Um, but they're generative for a while. So thanks, Maxie. Okay. Thanks. Please. Identifying other Piece of crap. Like just in your reading, I can feel obviously like the repetition and stuff. But um, what other specific things besides like flatness of character did you focus on and try to use with the novel? Um, I think uh, I was. I mean, voice is, voice is the starting place. So voice is generative for me. Um, and so I I was very interested in other voices that had 
Uh, there's, there's some King James Bible in this voice. So I read the Bible again, and I read, or parts of it, I didn't read it again. I read parts of it again, um, going back for it. There's actually a very specific description in the book that my editor was like super impressed with. He was like, this is genius. And I'm like, that is from the King James Bible. Um, <laughs> I, was with my, I was with my in-laws um, at Christmas Mass, my in-laws, and the, the, the reading um, uh, in a Methodist church, the, uh, the angels coming to the shepherd, see the shepherds, and the... Um, the description in the, in the King James Version that the shepherds were sore afraid, which is such a beautiful image, right? They're physically scared. I'm going back to some of those things. I'm um, so mining other places for voice. Um, the epigraph of the book comes from uh, Norwegian documents from the 1250s called the King's Mirror, which is a text that was written, um, supposedly, from a king to his son to teach him how to be kingly. It's a parenting text, right? It's like, this is how... Um, and when I was looking up things about squid, um, I found this document, and it, it includes all this stuff about like land ownership and how to get your knights to do what you want. And but it also is all this like the science, the animals around Iceland and Greenland and Norway. And there's this part about the kraken, um, where uh, the the scientific description of the time is that there's only two that appear, and they seem to have no offspring. It's always the same two; they never die, and they sort of reappear. This, this couple that can't reproduce or die, um, which became like a central, that, that idea became like central to the book. Um, there's all these pairs of couples in the books that, that are like inextinguishable in a certain way. Um, so finding other sources and other things that, that didn't seem to fit together and can you, can you make them work? And in the making it work, interesting things happen. Um, so those are some of the concerns. Um, is that your question? Oh, so, good, good, yeah, thanks. Please. Thank you. That's yeah, good. I do have an actual question. Good. Well, I was going to talk about that. But if you have a question, go ahead. So, so uh, just from your uh, the reading from your book, I yeah. noticed a theme. Of, I don't know how intentional it sure. is of uh, separation and dichotomy uh, with uh, the husband and wife separating more. Right. The bear and the squid. Uh, the deep house having things literally constantly being separate right. from sound, from object, uh, from action, from result. And I'm wondering uh, how intentional that was, if that's part of a spoiler from the narrative, or if uh, that draws from uh, myth and archetype. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's a, that's a big question. Um, so spoiler, it ends, which is like, it's like the end of the universe. Everything's super far apart from each other. No. Um, I... Uh, there's not a lot of things in the book. I mean, like, one of the constraints of this book, maybe one of the generative things this book is constrained, and there's, there's only, like, so many locations, right? There's the, the house and the dirt and the lake and the woods, and there are other versions of those things, but they're the same thing, right? He's in the deep house. It's another version of the house, but it's still house. Um, when he's at the bottom of the lake, it's, like, the deep part of the lake, but it's still lake. Um, and a lot of those things did seem to pair, like... There's, there's a tension between the place you build the house and the house, and then the house goes into that place. The lake and the woods, the bear and the squid, the finger and the fountain, the husband and the wife. Um, and those things do sort of, those pairings do get complicated, and they are, they were very, very generative. Um, I think it's, uh, it's very normal to have a two-page fairy tale that has things that limited. I think it's very odd to have a 300-page novel that has that few things that you have to keep rearranging and renewing and recharging and sometimes making new and figuring out how to do some of those things is really interesting. Um, I at one point thought this was a much smaller book. Um, the part where they, that I read where he goes into the deep house, I thought there was an end of the book there. Um, and when I got to that point, like the book like broke and there was this other thing that I had to read into. And I get to the bottom of the deep house and there's something else below it. And I didn't know that was there until I got to it. And I kept thinking like, I've, like I was trying to exhaust these forms, right? These, these 12 or 14 things I'm working with, and I'm gonna run them down, I'm gonna use them up, and I would get to the bottom of it and there would be another version underneath. Um, so it was generative in that way, um, that having to work with so little forced those things to be many things, and I think that that's part of how the book was generated. Is that what you asked? Uh, I, I think that makes sense. So Good. Good. <laughs> Please. Um, you obviously have a great um, like reading voice. Well, thank you. And um, I, I want to know, um, in, in creating a work like this and knowing how you desire for 
something like this to be read, right. communicated. How, how do you, how would you, uh, what, what's the mindset translating that to where someone else is reading it and they're not going to have You're right. the same, uh, you know, effect. And it's twofold, actually two questions. I'm sure. Here. So there's that. And then um, also, I just out of curiosity, wanted to know what was the driver uh, for you? Like, if there is there like a deep, like, I don't know, like a moral issue, or was sure. it just creative? Like, what was the, the engine behind producing a work like this? Um, let me tackle those separately. I'll tackle maybe the second one first. Okay. Um, I, I definitely never go into something with, like, this is what I'm trying to say in some ways. In some ways, um, so there's, like, write what you know, right? Which is, like, one of those truisms we hear in writing. I think um, there's another turn on that where it's, like, write what you want to know. And I think that for me, it's often write what I'm afraid to know, right? Like I'm, like, I'm going after something that bothers me or scares me, and I want to know more about. Um, a lot of my stories and a lot of my, my work has focused around um, I'm loss in response to sort of trauma. Um, and, and I've written this book and the book before were both real parenting and marriage-centered. And I think part of that is um, there's little that engages our fear of loss more than parenting or marriage, marriage, right? These are the things we're most afraid to lose. Um, and, uh, and so investigating some of those things. Um, I don't have kids, but I've, I've been married for, for nine years. And, um, and, and I think investigating those, those things is, has been really important to me. Um, I think I often do that by creating characters who make the opposite choices I would do. Um, the... the this book is set off by this horrific thing that the narrator does in the beginning that puts the fingerling inside him, and it's obviously this horrific choice, and it's hardly there to like break him from my psyche, right? And I have to write about a character I don't know. Um, so that's sort of the driving is that way. That's where it begins. Um, first, I try to move myself, and then in revision, try to make something that will move others, right? Um, the other part about trying to render the acoustics that I hear on the page um, so those cause me grammatical problems, right? <laughs> I read out loud constantly as I'm writing and revising. Um, I wrote most of this novel when I lived in a condo in Ann Arbor, in Michigan. Um, and the people next to us had the same floor plan as us, which meant that their bedroom was up against my office. Um, and I write really early in the morning. So like 6 in the morning, I'm there composing this stuff, like yelling it through their bedroom <laughs> wall. And I imagine now that I've moved away, they sleep better because there's not somebody yelling about giant squids and those babies behind their wall. Um, but so I hear it. And so I have, uh, I have comma usage problems that, are, that I often use commas to mark acoustic units in sentence, right? Like I'm marking off, like they're almost like I'm using them like line breaks, not like commas. Um, and my, uh, I was talking <laughs> before, you have a, a galley of the book, um, which has my old comma usage in it, not the new comma, after I'd been edited, but not copy edited. Um, and if you look, they'll be different. And they're, they're like, they point acoustic there. Um, and part of it is giving up control, right? Like to be, I, I did let my copy editor fix most of my comma usage so that it would be more correct in less the way I hear. Um, because it, you should read it differently. You should hear it differently. Um, one of the things that tends to make bad dialogue in student stories is over trying to overdetermine the, the dialogue, right? Where you want it to be read a suit certain way. Um, and I always show students like plays or screenplays, which have almost no directions for how a line should be read, right? Once in a while, you'll see like angrily. But like mostly, <laughs> it's just like, um, it's just the lines of dialogue instead of the actor to interpret. Um, I believe well-written sentences will resonate inside the reader anyway. Um, and so trying to give up some of my control. I'll over-control it, and then a revision, try to give it back. Because um, it's okay if you hear it differently, as long as what you hear is also powerful for you. Right? But certainly no one's going to hear it exactly the way I'm reading it. I, I know that. I'm pacing between paragraphs in a way that you couldn't put on the page, I don't right, think. Right. Yeah. Or it would be really awful looking. Yeah. It wouldn't look like a book. Yeah. Please. Your, excuse me, your craft essay kind of went against the grain, which yeah. I like, but Good. I'm wondering how other people have responded to it. Um, so I don't know, I, I will say, I, I don't know that I can speak too much for, for this particular craft essay, partly because the newspaper that solicited um, didn't publish it. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, but uh, I can tell you how it happens in reviews of the book. When uh, 
when you do something sometimes that is different, uh, there's, a, there's the best, and some of the best worst reviews in the book where people were negative about it, but they wrote these long, why they're negative about it, and what they were describing is what I'm proud of in the book, right? They're like, <laughs> the characters don't do this, and the language doesn't do this, and people aren't depicted this way, and I'm like, you're responding viscerally to this difference, right? This isn't the way I think stories work. And they're weirdly better descriptions of some of the things in the book than in the good reviews, right? Um, which is a, it's kind of fascinating um, that people are having like an aesthetic response to it. I, I do think, I will say, I have students who write stories that are fairy tales, right? And they bring them to class, and, and in workshop people are like, why don't these characters have names? Why don't they have backstories? Why don't they have this? And one of my jobs is to step in and show these other tools, these other possibilities. Um, psychological realism in fiction is not like the only choice. It's an agreed upon uh, norm that we sort of accept. But it's not the only choice. Um, there are lots of ways to make stories. Um, we've been talking in one of my grad classes a lot about time. We're all writing, everybody in my class is writing novels, about time works in novels. And like uh, Joan Silver has this book, The Art of Time in Fiction, which is really great. And she breaks time into these different ways. And one of them is like classic time, which is what we know. And she uses the Great Gatsby sort of as an example of how time works. Um, but you know, like scene, 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 backstory, moving back and forth. But then you have, you know, fabulous time, which maybe works by repetitions, which is how this book works. Time actually breaks the book. Time stops passing for a while. And then it starts up again. And, you know, talking about intent, like, um, the time in the book is not very important. The importance is these repetitions of sort of motifs and sort of things. Um, and some and reviews said the same thing. There's there's uh, a review about one of my favorite book reviewers, which I both is, is super generous. And the major complaint about it is these repetitions. And it's like that's one way to write a book, and everything doesn't have to be linear and used up. One way is to keep circling back. Um, it's okay. It's like and so people do respond. Um, sometimes people respond in this like that's not how books work. But there are lots <laughs> of ways that books work. Um, there are a lot of there's a lot of rooms in the house of art, right? And you can, you can live in any room you want. Um, but, the, but people who live in a different wing may not love your room. <laughs> That's okay, you know? So I, I, I think that, I don't know. Sometimes you have, to, you have to be willing to, every aesthetic choice you make has consequences, good and bad. And if you're willing to live with those, great. Um, I personally have a really high resistance to uh, backstory, and large amounts of backstory, um, because I feel the drag of it on a, on a narrative, on the forward thing. But obviously, if I say that, and you could immediately, I bet everybody in this room, come up with an example of like a story that's ruled by backstory and is amazing, right? And you would just be like, what you're saying is full of crap. But like, maybe it is. Um, but maybe not. It's just, they're choices. I would say, for me, the drag of backstory is not worth the gain of it. But for another writer, for um, someone like Mary Gayskill or Alice Munro or something, I mean, you can write stories about backstory, you know? Um, I would never, in my own stories, choose Virginia Woolf's interiority, where between two beats of forward action, there's 12 pages of interior thought. Um, but that doesn't mean Virginia Woolf isn't beautiful, right? I love Virginia Woolf. Um, so it's just choices. And, and people are going to react negative to choices the farther they are from the norm. But that doesn't mean you can't get away with them. Does that answer your question? It's a good question. It's a good rate. Thank you. Um, so you talked a lot about how you generate material. Yeah. I was wondering if you could maybe talk about your revision process. Yeah. And um, maybe the time difference between generating it and revising. Sure. Um, so I love revision. Revision is way better than generating. Generating is awful. Um, <laughs> it's so hard just to make up all this stuff. Um, and there's a lot of generating revision too. Uh, so when I was before I wrote this novel, um, I had written a couple of novels that just sort of failed. They sort of not come together. Um, a couple of them I finished and revised, but I never sent anything else out. Um, but I was starting to write really long stories, stories that were 30, 40 pages long. I was starting to write these big stories. And one of the things I found was that 40 pages was about the limit for a story for me because it was how much prose I could remember at once. On page 40, I can remember what happens on page 1. I can remember how page 1 works. I can think about, I can make a linkage between 40 and 1. Um, so how do you make a linkage between 400 and 1, right? Which is just more than I can control. Um, so I wrote this without a plan, without an outline. It took me about 10 months to write the first draft, uh, working pretty much every day. Um, I, uh, I got done. It took about a month off. I knew it was really uneven. And, sort of, and it was weird. I was revising as I went. 
but I, but it was like this ungainly sort of thing. Um, took a month off, I went back, read it again, uh, could see how much work it needed, was excited about the revision, found all these weird storylines that I'd started and never done anything with. I was like, oh, that's another version of this book that could happen. Uh, but I still was like, how do I attack this job? So I wrote an outline then of the first draft, um, an outline of what was there in the voice of the book, sort of. Um, and then I revised that outline into a plan for a second draft. I had this 10,000 word, 30 page outline of the book. Um, <laughs> I took that outline and I rewrote the book completely. I retyped it, I rewrote it completely from scratch. Um, I have two monitors at home and I put the old one on this one, a new one here, I retyped everything. And if I use something up, I deleted it over here. So I, I named this one Diminishing Draft. I just kept deleting it. And like one day this will be zero and this will be brilliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that took another like 10 months. I mean, and in that 10 months, it doubled in size. It went from like 60,000 words to like 130. Um, and then I spent another, and, but, but then that second draft was like the real book. That was like the story. I had it down, now it worked. And, and I found the first one, the 60,000 words, was actually like an outline. It was like a 60,000 word sketch of the thing, but not the thing. Um, there's a Borges story, I think, where, about a map maker who makes a one-to-one -one map of the world. Like he makes a map of the world that's exactly the same size as the map of, as the world. And I kind of felt like I had done that. Right? Like I had made a one-to-one -one outline of the book. Um, not the book, but the thing I would make the book from, but they were the same size. Um, and so, I, so, so then I took a month off again, I came back, and then it was like I was, I was doing the more line editing and sort of you know, cutting and adding and, and massaging scenes. Um, that third draft is when I did most of the research that's in the book. I didn't really research until about then. I did little researches, but um, I didn't do like major sort of and let's make sure I get the squid right, and let's make sure I get the bear right, let's make sure I get memory palaces right, let's make sure, you know, um, re reading all these books about, all, I mean, you'd be surprised how much there is to read about bear pregnancy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I find these great details in the book that are doing all this metaphors that I found two years into the book. Um, and uh, in that third draft, I thought I pretty much had it. I ended up with this like 120,000 word thing, that's what I queried agents with, and I sent out. Um, and I sent, and I hadn't shown anybody yet until I got done with that third draft. So that's, you know, two years in, I hadn't shown a, a word of it to anybody. Um, partly because I started, radio was coming out of grad school, and I was workshopped out a little bit, and I needed a break. Um, I was happy to work on my own. Uh, and so by the time I started querying agents, I also had given it to some friends, and I was getting these great responses from agents. Or I, God, if these had been book reviews, I mean, they, like one agent wrote me this four-page email about how I'd reinvented the Grecian myth. I'll stop it. She was like, but no. Um, <laughs> I mean, they were amazing. I mean, amazing. And I only sent it to like 15 agents who I, who I liked because I liked the writers I represented. And I was really targeted. Um, but so while this whole process was going along, I came, became convinced that the book was too long. That, that uh, my first readers and agent feedback and was sort of coming that the book was too long. I went back in and I, and I agreed and I started cutting it down. Um, and I got, my, I, I got my agent and sold the book in like a two week period, which is weird and, and rare. Um, I got my agent and, um, and an editor at Soho, who's not Mark Doan, who's my editor there, had asked for the, asked for the book based on stuff in magazines and that. Um, and I accepted it outside of the agent process like two weeks after I got my agent. So it was like a weird, not the normal process. But partly when him and I had talked, he knew I was cutting it down and their complaint was that it was too long. So, so they bought this long version knowing I was cutting it but not seeing that version. I eventually turned in like an 80,000 word version of the book, um, which is much tighter and better. And then uh, my editor and I edited the book. Um, and we had track changes on, right, for the, in Word for the whole time we were editing. And I think we made between six and 7,000 changes to the book, even at this process, third year. Um, and the final book is like 67,000 words. Um, and then it got copy edited between there and there. And the copy editing was so thorough and so good, and because if she would move a comma, and I would have to rewrite a whole sentence um, to make, my, make that still work with like, proper grammar, um, I ended up changing 10% of the sentences between that and this. Just because she would delete my commas or tell me a word didn't mean what I said it meant. And, uh, <laughs> and, it, and it meant this last final 10% like, of the sentence again. Um, so vision was crazy, but I think the, the 
biggest thing I learned was that outlining from the first draft, which was hugely helpful for me, that was when I needed a plan. The rewriting, I needed a plan. After I already had the plot figured out, I needed a plan. And the retyping from scratch, because you will not physically remake your worst stuff again. The worst sentences you write in the first draft, to make yourself physically make a bad sentence over and over, you just won't, I hope. Like you won't, you know, but it's easy to copy and paste them, right? And so having to retype them does that. So, but yeah, I talk about revision literally all night, so maybe I should. Um, I love it, but that's the good stuff. Do you have a final brilliant question? No pressure? <laughs> <laughs> or just a final question? I have a really mundane question. Okay, let's have mundane. Uh, Mud Luck Express did your first novella, right? Yes. And they just went out of business. Yes. Um, will anyone be bringing that back in the front? Yes. <laughs> um, the, it'll come back as part of a, um, a longer collection of stories um, in a couple years. Okay. So the next novel will come out, and then it'll come out after that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, please. Can, we, can you speak to aspiring writers when, when you're on the editing end, what you look for in the slush pile, whether books or stories? Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways it, it might be different between the two, but I would say in the broadest sense, um, what I'm really looking for is to be um, surprised. I mean, that's what gets me in first. I, I, just as in my own writing, I'm a voice person first. I will literally read a book about just about anything if the voice is compelling enough, if the form is compelling enough. So I'm always looking in that first page to see that, to sense that. This person has a compelling voice that I would follow anywhere, no matter what it's about. Um, so that was always, that's always the first thing that attracts me, sort of a manuscript. Um, when you read, and for those of you who work on the literary magazines here, I'm sure you already know this, when you read a lot of submissions, um, you see not just all the bad things people do, but all the good things people do that are common, like the kind of endings, kind of beginnings um, that are successful, they work, right? And in like a single case, that's, that works. Um, and then you read a thousand stories and you find that 200 of those people can do that ending um, successfully. Two people can do that opening, two people can write that voice. And so what I'm often looking for is, is something that is successful and is somehow outside that, somehow someone's surprising, someone who's doing something, something new. Um, that's what I want. I want I want to feel when I'm reading a story that the, so there's two kinds of stories that you don't accept because, or that you see because they're not, they're good but they're not quite done, right? Where it feels like, like one more revision, right? And you see that in a submission pile, this could use one more revision. And there's one kind where it just feels like the story is sort of, it's going to be a really good story, but like the person didn't push it all the way and you just send that story back. And then there's another kind where the reason the story needs one more submission is because somehow you sense that the ambition of it is just like off the charts, right? This person is just doing, they're doing something that they couldn't land, right? It's like they built this amazing machine and it crashed a little, but it's really exciting. And that's the kind of like 90% story where like, I want to accept it. I want to talk to this person. I want to work with this person. Um, I, I, I respond well to that. Like, I would rather see a story that's ambition outstrips sort of its, its place rather than something where the ambition is low and the execution is perfect. Um, like writing a, I don't know, I mean, it, it, there's something impressive about being in an amazing cover band, right? But, um, <laughs> but you don't get to win a Grammy, right? <laughs> uh, I guess you can win Grammys for covers probably. Um, you don't get, but, maybe, but I, wanna, I don't want to see that. I'm not as excited about that. Um, I want to feel that the work is taken as far as it could be or that the work is you know, somehow incredibly ambitious. Um, but that's maybe very specific to me in some ways. I think that has, has a lot to do with my own aesthetics, my own wants. Um, I want to push myself that way, and I wanted to publish people who are pushing themselves that way. That I, there's a writer I published in the, the third or fourth issue of The Collagist um, named Sarah Nork, who doesn't have a book yet. She's, she's one of my favorite writers, I think, in America that doesn't have a book. Um, and the first thing of hers I saw, it was just like, I mean, just like the most amazing alien had written it. I was just like, where did this person come up with this voice? Where did they come up with this structure? Um, and while, while, but, but not resisting it in that way, right? Like, like being totally moved by it, totally went over by it, and not understanding it at all. Um, I, I ran a magazine where I didn't have to talk in committees about what to accept. I accepted what I wanted to accept. And that meant I accepted stories I didn't understand, but that moved me enormously, right? Um, there's something wonderful about that. I didn't have to explain it to anybody. I didn't have to sit around with 10 people and be like, do we think this is a good story? 
I think some of the stories I published would have failed under that light. Um, but they were doing something that seemed incredibly personal and unique and had been pushed really far. And that made me want to be a part of them being in the world. Um, even if, you know, gun to my head, I wouldn't have been able to be like, I don't know why it's good, but I know that it is, you know? Um, I don't know. I think that's exciting. Um, I, I'm happy not to always be able to quantify why I publish something um, and take risks in that way. Um, we ask writers to take risks. I think publishers should take risks. Um, it should sometimes feel stretched by the decision to put something into the world. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Really wonderful.